All the way back in early 2006, ATI rolled out the Radeon X1900 series of graphics cards. Equipped with a powerful R580 GPU, these cards changed the game when it came to brute force pixel shading capability and overall was a large improvement over their previous X1800 series. This made the high-end X1900 XTX and XT some of the fastest video cards in the world at the time, but what would happen if you put two of these monsters together? Well, in the same breath, ATI also launched the elusive X1900 Crossfire Edition. This special edition card was a Radeon X1900 XT with ATI's compositing engine on board, allowing the user to run two of these fast flagships. Today we're going to be looking back at X1900 Crossfire and finding out how it performed, how well it stacks up against one of ATI's future offerings, and if it was all really worth it back in 2006. Now, back in the day Crossfire was set up very differently compared to later iterations. Where newer cards had the hardware required for Crossfire on the GPU itself, this hardware is off-chip on the R580 GPU and as such ATI needed to add it PCB side to allow for multi-GPU setups. Enter Crossfire Edition cards. Now, As I mentioned, these included a compositing engine on board but made use of an external interconnect via this special VHDCI port at the rear I.O. Being proprietary, it requires a special Crossfire Y cable and only then can you pair the card with a standard X1900. While this was all well and good back in 2006, over 15 years later, the Crossfire Edition cards and special cable are both very rare and usually quite expensive if you do come across them, which makes reproducing the setup today a challenge to say the least. Starting with the Radeon X1950 Pro, ATI would integrate all of the logic for Crossfire onto the GPU itself and employ a Crossfire finger, which removed the need for special edition cards and used a common and dirt cheap ribbon cable instead goes to show how clunky these early iterations were, and the ever-increasing scarcity of these components makes it a pain to get a hold of everything you need these days. In my case, I'm happy to say I got quite lucky. My X1900 Crossfire card was purchased online for quite cheap, and the cable was graciously sent to me by fellow TechTuber Pixelpipes, so a huge thanks goes out to him for making this video possible, as I doubt I would've been able to track one down on my own. With that tidbit on Classic Crossfire, let's move on to some details on the card itself. Now as far as specs go, the card is configured identically to a Radeon X1900 XT, supporting the same R580 GPU as expected, a 625MHz core clock, and 512MB of GDDR3 running at 725MHz. Now in contrast to the X1900 XT, you would have paid a $50 premium putting the Crossfire Edition at $600. US Now that was a pretty tidy sum for a card back in the day. When taking into account a second card, which would have been an additional 550 to 650 USD depending on which one you got, you'd be looking at a pretty eye-watering amount of money for just GPUs back in the day. Really shows that this was more of an ATI enthusiast thing rather than a viable solution for the standard consumer. With that, let's look at what we're going to be testing and how we're going to do it. Now to offer a point of comparison, I wanted to line these bad boys up against their successor, the Radeon HD 2900 XT. This first generation DX10 card offered an absolutely massive performance uplift compared to a single one of these cards, so the pair of X1900s definitely have their work cut out for them. I'll also be providing results from a single X1900 XTX to provide an idea of how well the two card setup is scaling. Now I originally planned to have an 8800 GTS 640 along for the comparison, but uh, let's just say disaster struck when I tried to boot it up after a while of not using it. As for the test system, it's completely overkill for these cards. I used a 3770 overclocked to 4.4GHz, as well as 16GB of DDR3 clocked to 2400MHz with a cast latency of 10. All of the other specs along with the OS and drivers will be on screen, so without any further ado, let's now dig into some testing. The first game up is the well-known system killer of 2005, Fear. I used a standard 55 second run of the built-in benchmark and completely maxed out the game at 1080p along with using 4x FSAA. Here the X1900 Crossfire setup leads the charge with 89 frames per second on average. Now that's 48% faster than the 2900 XT which sees a large performance drop with 4x FSAA. Compared to the single card we're seeing very good scaling here of around 85% or so. A nice result indeed. Frame times didn't look so hot in any of the cards tested which is expected of this benchmark, but the Crossfire setup does seem to fare the worst as overall it sees the most variance across the graph. Next up we have World in Conflict, and I chose to use the medium settings at 1080p using a full 50 second run of the built-in benchmark to get my numbers. This time it's the 2900 XT leading the pack with 77 FPS on average, which beat out the two X1900 cards by about 18%. Speaking of which, the scaling in this title was pretty lackluster as there's only a 35% improvement over the single card. Additionally, frame times were poor on all of the setups, with every card exhibiting fairly large stutters throughout the benchmark, but the X1900 cards had quite a bit of micro stutter with this as well. 
Devil May Cry 4 is the next game, and I benched it using the first 75 seconds of the built-in benchmark with the high settings at 1080p. Here the tables have turned with the X1900 Crossfire setup leading with a whopping 103 frames per second on average, or 13% faster than the 2900 XT. Now compared to the single X1900 XTX, we're seeing around 90% scaling, which is excellent, and a very impressive thing to see when testing old Crossfire. Frame times weren't even that bad on the setup, with only a little bit of micro stutter present, but the single card and especially the 2900 XT still beat it handily in this regard. Next is Far Cry 2, and here I used a full 50 second run of the built in benchmark to obtain my results, and selected 720p with the high preset and no AA. The pack of X1900 still top the charts here with 79fps, but only barely edges out their R600 successor by 4%. This game also bodes well for the scaling as we're seeing an 88% increase over the single card, again very nice to see. Frame times were excellent on the 2900 XT and pretty decent on the X1900 XTX, but with the crossfire setup, frame times suffer as expected. Crisis is next up in the suite, and I tested using the built in benchmark at 720p with a medium preset and no AA. Here we can see the two X1900s take their second loss, with the 2900 XT beating them out by 19%. Scaling is a little less impressive here, being 68%, but it's still a decent result. Funnily enough, every card exhibited noticeable micro stutter in this game, but the only card that had it really bad was the single X1900. Also, the Crossfire setup had a couple of large hiccups here and there which reflects in the rather anemic 0.1% lows. Now, I've mentioned this a few times before, but for those who don't know, I'll say it again. The built-in benchmark renders a fixed amount of frames, and since the game engine is tied to the frame rate in the benchmark, some setups will finish at different times, which is why the 2900 XT and Crossfire setup had a much shorter run. Second to last game is Stalker Call of Pripyat, and here I used a full run of the built-in benchmark with a medium preset at 720p. Now the two X1900s put down 84 frames per second on average here, which was 11% faster than the 2900 XT and 83% faster than the single X1900 XTX. That's pretty good scaling for a later game. All of the cards have their frame time issues with this game as expected, but the Crossfire setup does see a considerable amount of micro stutter compared to the other setups. Finally we have Tomb Raider, and I did a 60 second run of the built in benchmark with a low preset at 720p and this time the 2900 XT takes back the lead, averaging 92 frames per second or around 10% faster than the two X1900 cards. Comparing to the single card, the crossfire setup is seeing around 68% scaling, which again is on the lower end but nothing bad. Frame times were pretty good on both the 2900 XT and X1900 XTX, and again the two X1900 cards are a lot more micro stuttery in comparison, but it's not nearly as bad as it was in Stalker. Overall it's a good result, especially for a game that came a lot later on. With all the testing done, let's average out all the results, and as you can see the X1900 Crossfire setup averages 81 FPS in the suite, just barely slipping past the 2900 XT which sits at 78 FPS. The X1900 XTX averaged 46 FPS, which means that overall we see 76% scaling with the two cards. Considering how varied the suite is and the fact that we're not just testing games of the time but also titles of the future, that's a pretty damn impressive result if you ask me. With this though we can see that yes, two X1900 cards will be pretty much as fast as their successor, and that's pretty amazing when you consider that the 2900 XT was 70% faster than a single X1900 XTX in the suite. I mean what a generational improvement really shows how much of a game changer it was moving on to a new unified shader architecture. To round off the testing session, I benched total system power consumption with each of the setups to get a rough idea of how thirsty the cards are. For this I used a static scene from Crisis's built-in benchmark and allowed each card to heat up for 10 minutes before taking my measurement. Regrettably, I didn't check what maximum temperature the cards ended up at, but I'm sure this allowed enough time for them to stabilize at their max. Also, keep in mind that these numbers were taken straight from the wall and they do not factor in PSU efficiency. Starting off the bottom, we have the single X1900 XTX, which sees total system power consumption at 195 watts. Moving on to the Thirsty 2900 XT, the system power consumption rose 24% to 241 watts. Goes to show how thirsty this R600 successor was, but it doesn't compare to the two X1900s in Crossfire, having a total system power consumption of 282 watts at the wall, or 45% more than with a single card. This setup is fast, but it definitely pigs out on power as shown here. It's one of the thirstier setups I have tried.
coming to a conclusion, I have to say I'm pretty impressed by the performance offered by this Crossfire setup of yesteryear. It being able to go head to head with the 2900 XT is no small achievement, and shows that even in later applications, these cards are very capable as long as the support for Crossfire is there. It's interesting to see because I would say DirectX 9 hardware isn't exactly synonymous with aging well, but it does make a lot of sense as the R500 architecture was well equipped for the future for a number of reasons, one big one being the inclusion of dedicated scheduling hardware. So was the setup worth all of the trouble back then? Well, like I oftentimes say, it depends. A setup like this was definitely out of the question for value seekers as the prohibitively high price would have disqualified it from winning any price performance awards, but if money was no object and you were seeking some of the best of the best, you really couldn't do much better than X9200 Crossfire. It would have been ridiculously fast, even more so than some high-end DX10 cards of the future as shown here, although I'm certain it wouldn't have measured up with Nvidia's Monster 8800 GTX which came along a little bit later. Overall, if you were seeking an extremely fast setup back in early 2006, X1900 Crossfire probably would have been one of the best options available for the time, as it would still be another 10 or so months before Nvidia rolled out their 8800 GTX, and over a year before ATI would release the 2900 XT. It was a pain to acquire everything I needed, but I still really enjoyed recreating the 17 year old Crossfire setup. In the mid 2000s GPU roundup video I've planned, these cards are going to be part of the suite, and I think they'll perform very admirably. Anyhow, I think that about does it for this retro review. Thanks for sticking around to the end, and I'll see you all in the next one.